The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, aliens, psychopaths, and avatars going wild meet in the Grand Central Arena. Thanksgiving on the way to Mars and fighting the Kaiser's forces as they storm toward California. And a Black Friday booster rocket filled with sugar plums, e-book gift certificates, and a couple of wayward pilgrims who got off on the wrong timeline. Plus, part 37 of the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain editor Tony Daniel. Happy Thanksgiving in America and Canada. And hey, happy Hanukkah. It starts on Thanksgiving this year. This won't happen again for 77,798 years, according to some reckonings. I hope to be there to see that one if we can solve that death thing with a bit of nanotechnology. Christmas is coming, of course. Winter solstice is coming up for all you pagans and heathens. And ho, 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 our favorite holiday of the year here at Bain, Black Friday. Coming up, we have an interview with Bain author Reich E. Spohr. He's the co-author of the Boundary series of hard science fiction novels with Eric Flint, the author of epic fantasy adventure Phoenix Rising and of cool paranormal thriller Digital Night. Reich's new book is Spheres of Influence, which is book two in his Grand Central Arena science fiction adventure universe, and the sequel to Grand Central Arena. Discussing Reich's new book with him is Bain Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey, with yours truly jumping in for a question or two. And we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. But first, Associate Editor Laura Haywood Corey joins me for the news. The holiday season is upon us, and that means you have to tell all your friends and family who don't have a clue about science fiction and fantasy what you might like to receive, or you'll end up with an old DVD of Blade Runner with the narration still in it. Hey, some people, not me, like the narration. Yes, poor benighted fools. Now, there are a couple of ways you might go about this. One is to point out a new book, your nudge, nudge, wink, wink, really looking forward to knowing it exists somewhere out there, for instance. Well, we have two new Bane hardcovers in December. One is Mars, Inc. by Ben Bova, and that's a take on The Man Who Sold the Moon, about an entrepreneur who puts together a private effort to send a manned expedition to Mars. Yeah, we'll have an interview with the great Ben Bova soon here on the podcast. What else is out, Laura? Well, uh, if you like alternate history, Robert Conroy has a new book, 1920, America's Great War. This is the one where Germans win World War I in Europe and then attempt to invade the United States. Yeah, Bob Conroy's alternate histories are always really thought-provoking and exciting. And we could remind everyone that Bain's Christmas-themed science fiction anthology, A Cosmic Christmas to You, is out in booksellers everywhere. Consider yourself reminded, oh listener. Now, Laura, what if you're not sure of your science fiction reading dear one's reading taste? Can we help those people? Yes, we can, especially if they're ebook readers. You can order Bain ebook gift certificates in advance at bainebooks.com. And the gift voucher will then be delivered to you, and you can print it out and include it in a card. Or in the glove compartment of that new helicopter you got them. Well, we can't help with the helicopters, but you can find more information about our Bain eBooks gift certificate program at BainEbooks.com. BainEbooks.com? BainEbooks.com. Please join me in welcoming Reich East 4 to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. Reich's first novel with Bane, Digital Night, came out 10 years ago last month, in fact. Uh, Fe- hey. Yay! Phoenix Rising, hey. its epic fantasy novel, is now out in mass market paperback. Portal, the third in the hard SF series that he's co-authored with Eric Flint, came out just a few months ago. And this month sees the release of Spears of Influence, the sequel to Grand Central Arena. So it's uh, 2013, it's the year of Reich's Spore. I go to double digits in in uh, in my years of publication, and I think next year I'll go to double digits in terms of numbers of books out. Pretty awesome. 
So that's, that's very ex- it's very exciting for me, certainly. Definitely. So when you first started writing Grand Central Arena and then Spheres of Influence, did you intend for them to be pointers back to the golden age of SF? Because as we've talked about, that's how they functioned for me. <laughs> um, well, yes. I, I certainly hoped that uh, people who read Grand Central Arena and who now uh, read Spheres of Influence uh, would wonder at all these references and uh, go back and sample some of the old style stuff. Uh, I understand that it will turn out for some people that you know they they can't get into it because uh, time and writing uh, styles and tropes have moved on. Um, but I certainly hope that at least some people would go back and see where some of these things started from. Particularly, of course, Doc Smith. Right, I'm. Uh, he was the single greatest salute in there. That the the book is dedicated to him. Yep. Um, because he sort of created he he created me in a sense. <laughs> I'm about halfway through uh, Skylark of Space right now, and I was talking with it with our sort of senior editor emeritus, Hank Davis, who's our Golden Age expert, and he was talking about uh, about uh, the series. Do you want to add a little bit, Hank? Yeah. Well, after all, uh, the Skylark of Space was the... Uh, it, although it wasn't the first story to leave the solar system, it... Uh, set the pattern and caused a lot of other writers who mostly had been flying around in the solar system to go out to other stars. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure why they were hesitant to do that before Doc Smith. Uh, uh, maybe they just thought travel to the stars was impossible. There are a lot of people who still think that. And, but af- after that, although Doc Smith uh, didn't come up with any sort of hyperdrive, he just had his character say, well, I guess relativity doesn't work, or something like that, when they find themselves traveling faster than light. Well, what he said, what he said was, what he said was uh, well, relativity is a theory. This distance we have achieved is observed fact. Uh-huh. And fact trumps theory. Okay. Yeah, as, Fred, as the astronomer Fred Hoyle once said, there, there's always a problem of beautiful theories being slayed by cold, brutal facts. But, uh, of course, he did come up with a faster light uh, drive, uh, neutralizing inertia for the Lensman books later on. But a- after that point, uh, people were flying all over the galaxy. So that that was a turning point. And, of course, it was a... It was such a revolutionary novel that it took it 10 years from the time it was written, if, if I remember right, to be finally uh, published. It yeah, had he the finished wait. the original draft in 1918, and it was uh, 1928 that he finally got it published. Yeah, right. It, he had to wait for Amazing Stories to be started before anybody would uh, touch it. I understand Argosy thought it was fascinating, but they didn't think that he, they, the editor didn't think their readers would be able to go along with all the stuff happening in it. Uh, that that was where, yeah, if it wasn't Argosy, is one of the other pulps, the guy that uh, uh, had been publishing uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs to great acclaim. And I think I think I need to shut up. I seem to be taking over. <laughs> well, that was a very lots of fascinating information. So, what appeals to you the most about Doc Smith's writing, Reich? What what grabbed you? Well, Doc Smith to me was the uh, especially at the age where I encountered him, which was around 12. Ah, the golden age of SF is 12. 12. And I was handed the book Second Stage Lensman by my uh, sixth grade teacher. Um, and it was a total eye-opener. And it's the it was his sense of scale and sense of wonder, which is what he generated in some... There are a number of, of tropes. Basically, Doc set the tone. He didn't just set the tone. He set the standard for um, space opera and started many of the tropes that have become standard in the genre since. Um, there's a trope, uh, the you know, Doc Smith uh, power escalation. Um, Doc was able to start you at the bottom scale of power and just keep escalating the battle the uh, the Lensman arms race is another way that they call it, where you start out with firing laser beams that can cut their way through a ship, and by the end of your um, arms race, you are detonating entire solar systems using faster-than-light planets. 
Wow. Playing in Skylark, you go beyond that, and finally you are literally wiping out galaxies with pinpoint accuracy so that you can remove the good guys from the galaxy and leave the bad guys there for it to blow up. It's, uh, that is the climactic uh, point in uh, Skylark Decay. So I will be um, looking but forward. what appealed to me is that he combined this ludicrous escalation of power and this tremendous grand scale. I mean, the, the, the prologue for the Lensman series starts out, you know, two and a half billion years ago, two galaxies were colliding. This, and, this, and this gives you right away a sense of time scale because it matters that those two galaxies were colliding two and a half billion years ago. And therefore, from that, he builds all the way up uh, through the modern era and then beyond and tells us this history and then has the, uh, and then has us zoom in to what's happening in this particular point in the future and follows, for the most part, uh, the adventures of Kimball Kennison, uh, a uh, young lensman who ends up becoming the single most important uh, agent of civilization. And it's the combination of the scale and the fact that he adds both a hard edge to it. Um, he will find things that he, that he knew how to do in real life. For example, making a, a working an explosives assembly line, which he actually did at one point, or um, mining or things like that. And he will describe it in a very hearted sense. You say, oh, this is real stuff. And that will give a sort of a solidity to the fantastic stuff, like uh, the faster-than-light drive that uh, um, Hank mentioned, which is the Bergen home. And he describes first how this is developed and how the initial version is a little uh, difficult. It's kind of rough, and there are problems with it running. Uh, he compressed time scales so that uh, you could do your research and come out with a new uh, weapon or new gadget quickly but he always respected the actual effort that was involved in that, so you got the impression that whoever was doing this had to do a lot of work to achieve their goals. It wasn't just wave your hands and the gadgets appeared. You had to do a lot of work to bring things up. But it was also this scale and an, um, an optimism. I've seen a lot of dark stuff that's come out over my lifetime. I've seen there's a trend that went uh, that started, I guess, in the late 1970s, where things went from bright and shiny to dark, and I suppose in some ways you had to have a reaction in that direction. Mm -hmm. But I've always preferred ones where the good guys win, the bad guys lose, and where most of the time it's fairly clear that these guys are good, those guys are bad. Right. And mm -hmm. uh, Doc was very clear on that. And uh, at the same time, good guys didn't have to be wusses either. They had to be, but they could still be nice people. You know, there's, there's somewhere, well, the good guys are like Batman. No, he, he, his guys weren't like Batman. His guys were more like Superman. And honestly, I like Superman better than Batman, even if Batman is probably a more fun character to write. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I want to go back to something you said about having ex experience and knowledge and having it kind of show up in the writing. You've been online since, what, 1978, thereabouts? Does the fact that you've I'm got for email in 1976? Yes, yeah, so since you've had email and been involved online for so long, did that influence your depiction of computers and artificial intelligences in Grand Central Arena and spheres of influence at all? Well, to an extent, yes, um, but it's. It's not so much the length of time, but the diversity of encounters that I've had with different forms of uh, computing. Mm -hmm. um, the era of Grand Central Arena is, you know, 300 years from now. Right. Honestly, nobody can predict what's going to be going on 300 years from now. Um, if I go by uh, Werner, uh, oh, I never pronounce his name right, Vinji? Vinji, yep. Um, his, yeah, Vinji's predictions. Uh, we'll hit at some point in there. You'll hit the singularity, and whatever comes after that is something utterly beyond my comprehension or yours. Mm -hmm. um, so, in a way, you have to cheat <laughs> when you're showing far future stuff, but you want the audience to be able to hook into it, or you have to be willing to depict something that's so bizarre and and hope that people will pick it up. But since this is salute to the golden age, the assumption is that we'll never quite hit singularity. 
Yeah. Got a lot of stuff that will change the world. But what I did with the the um, computers and everything is I looked at what we have done over these years, and I said, well, what's the ultimate evolution of what we're seeing? Well, the first is that you'll still have computer games and entertainments, but they will be as complex and diverse almost as life itself. If you want to get lost in one of them and live a life there, you can. And it will be, it will be full immersive. It will be as real to you as the real world you're sitting in because it will have full sensory input. That was one extrapolation. The next one was, well, we're trying to make uh, artificial intelligences. All right. Um, I have to assume we will achieve that. They're, they're, that, that we will figure out one day, someday, to make uh, computer intelligences. I didn't want them to be enemies of people, and I didn't want them to be all you know, separate computer things. So I said, well, what would we do to make them acceptable to us? Well, we'd make them people, people that are close friends. And from extrapolating that, I, basically everyone has what's called an I-SAGE, that's spelled A-I-SAGE, because artificial intelligence SAGE or advisor intelligence. Basically, it's a best friend intelligence that can automatically do all the stuff you'd like to do and sort the information for you. You know, So they, they act as your combination friend, secretary, um, computational bodyguard, you know, keeping out uh, viruses and stuff. Um, and most people in the Grand Central Arena universe would have these as standard equipment built, you know, in cybernetics into their head. They actually have the Ice Age riding with them all the time. So it's somebody that's always with them, always supporting their thinking, trying to think, oh, what was that thing I was trying to remember? The Ice Age catches it and throws it up to them from their memory where they're having trouble finding it um, and constantly support them. So, However, there's still a concern about... Um, AIs that are smarter than people, so there's some restriction about how intelligent you're allowed to have some AI that's outside of a controlled area. There's still fear. The Frankenstein fear still exists. It's just more hidden. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if, it, if I tried to do anything that was directly influenced by my own computer experiences other than you know, having done games, having done computer interaction, mainly because Vinci had done it so much better when he did fire upon the deep, I wasn't even going to try to go in that direction. You know, he, he took Usenet, basically, and <laughs> used it as a central conceit in the middle of that novel. I wasn't going to play in that area because the main idea of the uh, novel was more for the golden age adventure. Hey, Reich, uh, it's Tony Daniel here. Uh, can you explain the arena just for those of us who, uh, who may not have, uh, have read Grand Central Arena? How it works? Well, if anyone really knew that, then they'd be gods, or at least something close to it. Right. The arena is the biggest construct I could imagine, or at least to start with. <laughs> um, it is a enclosed piece of space-time, which is basically a universe that has a one-to-one -one isomorphic correspondence with ours, but is effectively shorter, smaller in size, so that moving a short distance in the arena is equivalent to moving a very, very long distance in hours. The joker in the pack, of course, is that some tremendous force or forces, which are called by the residents of the arena the void builders, got there first. And instead of just going into a parallel universe where you can just move around, you've got a place that is filled up with what amounts to a scale model of our universe, modeled in and maintained in full real time, um, thereby violating uh, the postulate that there is no actual time. Uh, the arena itself serves as a universal frame of reference. Um, there are spheres, each sphere being a equivalent to a solar system, and when you leave your solar system, you find yourself inside your selected sphere on top of the sphere, there is living space, a full planetary type living space. There is air that fills the arena, mostly breathable air. The spheres drift in this floating there, something like uh, the vision that I had was something like uh, Roger Dean's painting of the uh, floating things that uh, called Yes Songs from the uh, Yes um, album covers back in the, I think it was the 70s when he painted them, these giant floating islands. 
far as something that might be more familiar to people these days. It's uh, imagine that that floating islands you saw in the movie Avatar, but imagine that instead what you've got are spheres that have that island sort of piece on top of them, and they are floating in an infinite void with storms that could be millions of miles long, because the void itself is something between 16 and 32 light years across, and there's one sphere for every star, and these, each of these spheres is gathered into a sphere pool, which is exactly analogous to a galaxy. So there's 100 billion spheres and 100 billion galaxy sphere pools, and all of these directed by something that people also call the arena. People tend to assume it's probably some sort of gargantuan artificial intelligence, but they don't know for a fact yet. And within the arena, there are rules. Nuclear power does not work. It is shut down. Artificial intelligences do not work. They are shut down. And there are other various rules that basically limit and direct how you interact with other sentient races, um, thereby making competition within the arena more on an even footing, according to whatever standards the arena itself has set, and giving you the opportunity, even as a newcomer to the arena, to gain your gain in status and position. But nobody knows exactly what all the rules are because the arena doesn't state them. You sort of have to find them out on your own on occasion or get other people who've learned to tell you something. And the arena works mostly on what are called challenges. And a challenge can be almost anything. It can be a life or death duel. It can be a board game or anything else that you, that the two factions agree to. But the stakes can be immense. They can be literally betting your own, a solar system that you own could be on the table. And usually it's something that is high stakes for whoever's involved. Mm, would you want to live in the universe of the arena? I I would like to visit. I would like to would, visit the archives of the analytic, and I would just yeah. love to just soak up all the knowledge in there. Visit is one thing. I'd love to visit it. But the problem with the universe of the arena, I would love to live in the future that I depict in the arenaverse. Mm-hmm. But the actual universe of the arena itself, there's something besides our system. The arena is a very scary thing. And it gets scarier as time goes on. Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same thing where, would you like to live in the universe uh, in Doc Smith's Civilization, the Lensman series? Well, maybe. You know, there are a lot of safe places, and most people won't be hurt. But Jesus, the bad things that can happen to you are pretty scary. <laughs> um, I would certainly like to visit. There's some wonderful, wonderful things I'd like to see there. I want to meet um, Sun Wukong. I would love to spend... I want to live there because if they ever, <laughs> they ever realized that uh, who I was, well, there's a lot of people that would just want to kill me. <laughs> At least them being the Hyperion. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, I would love to spend an afternoon with Sun Wukong. Oh, he's, he's, he is so much fun to write. <laughs> um, he, he is the, uh, the innocent warrior... Uh, he gives me a different point of view to play with in spheres that I didn't have in uh, Grand Central Arena. I always knew that I wanted to bring him in, but I didn't, you know, I had to wait till I found out he was doing spheres before I could really commit to putting him in. Mm -hmm. You see, you do hear hints about his existence beforehand, but you don't really need him until then. Um, I'd obviously love to meet um, Wukong. Um, I'd like to meet all of them, although, again, I sure wouldn't. I uh, want Duquesne to realize, so you're the guy who designed Hyperion, really. <laughs> I could see that going quite interestingly. It would go very badly, <laughs> unless you decided. But on the other hand, that means if I kill you, there's no more uh, no more story. Yeah, it could be. Or maybe you'll just get grabbed by the fanfic writers. All right, fine, you get to leave. <laughs> uh, yeah, so Orphan would be probably one of the most fun ones to hang out with, though. Yeah, that too. I love one. I, I don't want to spoil. It. Yeah, don't want to spoil it. But I I really liked the scene near the end of uh, Spheres of Influence with the with the streamers, and we'll just let everyone find that for themselves. <laughs> yeah. Well, well, the nice 
thing about Orphan is that he can always adjust to your situation. Mm-hmm. Is, uh, is, and I always, I, I have voices for these people. You know, when I'm reading them, I, or writing even, I hear them. I know what they sound like. Um, sometimes I can make the voice, sometimes I can't. Orphan, Orphan sounds uh, like uh, Andreas Katsoulis, Jakar from Babylon 5. Oh, wonderful! You have can you can you do orphan for us? Oh, uh, Miss Austin, I am afraid that I will not be able to assist you on this particular matter. But perhaps later I can show you a way to deal with your next problem. That's the way that he tends to talk. That sounds um, neat. Um, Tomas Garayo is um, Christopher Lee. From um, you know, as Saruman. Oh, nice. Deep, deep rumbling voice. Mm-hmm. Um, I can't. I I can sometimes do them. Let's see. Miss Austin, you have chosen to challenge something far beyond your understanding, and I am afraid that victory is impossible. While Sun Wukong. Is of course much uh, higher, more cheerful. Hey, how you doing? Oh wow, look at that! Oh, I gotta go see that. Oh, bye. <laughs> it's uh, Wukong. Is 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 Mister Add superpowered? I, I can't do Ariane's voice because she is the, the the first main character, so to speak, and those always get my voice because I know that they're the central one that I talk with. Mm. But so it's not what she sounds. She has a. Um, Sigourney Weaver is probably the closest. That's not quite it, but that's close. I kind of pictured her as Claudia, as Ivanova, kind of similar to Ivanova. That would not be a bad. That would not at all be a bad choice. Matter of fact, you know, she could. Uh, you could envision her that way, and it would not be a bad disservice at all. <laughs> I love Claudia Christian. She did. Ivanova is great. Yes, you could imagine her like that. Although I, I visually, I think more Sigourney Weaver. So can oh, you... because Sigourney always looked taller. I'm not sure exactly how tall Claudia Christian is, but Sigourney okay. always looked taller, and Ariane is quite tall. She's 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, hey, can you give us a hint of what's next for Ariane and her companions? Well, the <laughs> end of Spheres pretty much tells us what's going to happen. They, mm-hmm. uh, they're going to have to settle a couple of things, but the main adventure, at least for the first major part of the novel, is going to be traveling with Orphan, through the deeps of the arena, no no gates or anything, actually sailing somewhere where Orphan knows how to get to, but nobody else does, the place where he got that gadget that allowed him to stop or at least slow Amas Garayo's power in the one time that the entire group had to confront the uh, Shade Weaver. Um, he's being very, very closed-mouthed about what that is, and one can't blame him. Because obviously it's not a shade weaver gadget, mm-hmm. and it's not a faith gadget. So it's something that is capable of playing on their level, but is neither one of them. There actually is a sort of a hint in uh, spheres that would tell you something, a possibility of what it is that they're going to confront. Um, but uh, long term, of course, there's many other things that have to happen. I, there's going to be a very interesting... A competition that uh, Sun Wukong is going to get involved in. Um, oh, obviously, um, Simon has to finish learning about this, uh, the ability that he's gained. That he's just started to learn. He, he just learned of its existence in the spheres, and he has to learn how to control it, rather like Ariane has to learn how to control hers. But his is different because what he has is apparently something nobody's ever had. So there's... At least there's people out there that, in theory, could tell Ariane what she can do with the power she gained uh, at the end of her confrontation with the Mascarayo. But there's nobody that can tell Simon how to do what he does, or what its limits are, or, or anything else about it. He, what happened to him is utterly unique. It's never happened before. <laughs> when it happens, if you read carefully, you'll see that even the whatever powers exist in the arena have the same reaction, like, What? <laughs> What is that? That's, I don't know what that is. You do tabletop role-playing games, and you like anime, and 
Do you think that you're a better author because of the time you've spent doing gaming and enjoying anime? I mean, it's um, is storytelling an inherent activity where the format doesn't matter? For me personally, yes, I am. If I wasn't a gamer and didn't uh, get involved with anime, I might not be a writer, at least not a good enough one to be published. Because gaming taught me a lot of things. I wrote a very long uh, essay on this uh, on my website, actually. Um, but um, gaming taught me all sorts of things about building a world, making it consistent, trying to understand how it worked. And for me, these are very important things when I'm writing, to understand why things work the way they do. Um, and gaming gave me a structure to hang this on and to work with it. In the more specific sense of writing, well, I built the world Zarathan, which was uh, the world in which Phoenix Rising takes place. Uh, I built that for my gaming, mm -hmm. and I've been working on it for 35-plus years now. Um, and so there's direct relationship there. More importantly, though, was uh, when I started dating Kathleen and eventually married her, my wife, um, she was an anime fan and a gamer. And uh, we started gaming in this anime world based on uh, one of her and my, at the time, favorite anime called Saint Seiya. We built a huge, um, I mean, basically, fanfic universe on that, and we didn't just play in it, although we gamed out a lot of it, we also wrote, uh, we wrote the fan fiction based on the games and the characters and so on. I learned to write with that. Now, I was a very good writer in terms of writing action and things of that nature beforehand, but I sucked at characters. If I can do characters at all, it's because of the things that I worked on with Kathleen, and I wouldn't have done that without the combination of the gaming and the anime to give me a sort of a structure and a focus from which I could learn this sort of, of technique that I had not learned otherwise. Um, so, yes, it's been uh, hugely important. Plus, of course, I get a lot of um, direct inspiration out of gaming materials, anime, books, you know, ev everything that I do. And I incorporate it back. You know, I've got stuff. Uh, if I read stuff in a book, it will go into a game. If I watch something in anime will go into a game or it may inspire something in a book, just like uh, in Grand Central Arena. I've got a very long list of various uh, references in jokes and inspirations on my site for Grand Central Arena, and I'm going to have to build one up for... Uh, and I have one for Phoenix Rising, too, and I have to build one for Spheres of Influence. And that will show that I've got influences in there that range from... Um, the Chronicles of Narnia to Dragon Ball Z and everything in between. Yeah, I was a child of the 70s, and I, I am ashamed that I did not twig onto uh, Arion's name at first. <laughs> Arion Stephanie Austin, a.k.a. Yeah. Steve Austin. <laughs> yes. Yeah, in fact, the first version of her that I worked up was going to be bionic and have, uh, you know, arm, two, one arm and two legs that were you know, bionic, but I decided that was going too far. Well, yeah, well, then you'd have to, it'd have to be an audio book and it'd have to make the noise. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I have that as a box set. Too. I got the Time Life box set of that. Yeah. It's amazing how well that series aged, too. It's really, it really survived very well, which is not true of many others of its age. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw. I noticed your list of of the references and in jokes, and was going to ask you if you had one planned for Spheres of Influence as well. So we will definitely look for that once it's up. Yep, I have to go. It takes me a while to do that because I have to go through it chapter by chapter and read each line, read read it line by line, and see what I'm catching. And I don't put in everything either. For example, there's a whole huge section of things that are not in the Grand Central Arena one, namely the ones that translate. Uh, the Void Builder words. Mm -hmm. Every one of the Void Builder things that are set in there um, has a meaning, not, not a meaning in the sense of, oh, I translate these words to mean something by using some, uh, by, you know, because it's a language per se, but because it's, in a sense, it is a fan code. When you figure out what the fan code is, you'll see all the references involved with it. Well, that sounds like it'll be a fun treasure hunt. <laughs> it was a well. My beta readers certainly liked it, and at first they didn't get it. When some of them did, say, "Oh my God, you're not doing that!" Oh yes, I am. 
So there were things that I wasn't sure that I dared do that they told me to go ahead and do, such as uh, Moria Susana. I I didn't know if I had the balls to do that, and they said do it. <laughs> Actually, my wife first said do it, and then my beta reader said yes, do it, do it. <laughs> Those evil beta readers. So, in general, when you're writing, are you one of those people who works from a very detailed outline, or do you plot on the fly? Well, I've sort of been forced to do some outlining because, in general, Tony likes to have me likes to see what you plan on doing before she's going to pay you any money. <laughs> yeah. But my preferred style is basically, I know like four points that I have to get to in the story, and I write to that. Mm-hmm. So. The books that I have submitted as full books I generally didn't have an outline. It was just, oh, I know where this has to go. I have to get to here, and I have to get to there, and I have to get there, and there's the grand, uh, grand finale, and okay, I'm done now. And in fact, that's part of what drives me. If I had too detailed an outline, I know what's happening, and then I'm bored now. Not interested in writing it now. Done. Yeah, because you've already outlined it. Because you know, I already know what's going to happen. I already know what's happening now. There's no more surprises. Yeah. Um, what drives me often is getting to a particular scene where I've worked out the scene in great detail, but I haven't gotten to it yet. So I'm writing in order to get to this awesome scene. Uh, an example of that is, uh, not to spoil her too much, um, Wukong's reappearance mm-hmm. um, in Spheres of Influence, where he shows back up at that particular, that particular moment, the exact scene there, I had plotted out with every event. I knew exactly what was going to happen there. And I, since I write to music, I even had a particular theme of music associated with his reappearance. And so a lot of writing was writing to get to that point. So by preference, I don't use an outline. Sometimes I'll have to outline some pieces to make sure that I keep everything consistent, though. Um, Phoenix Rising, for example, I have notes but say, make sure you do this, make sure you do this, don't forget about that. How does it work when you're working with a collaborator like with Eric? Do you alternate chapters, or does one of you take certain characters to write, or how does that work? Well, when I worked with Kathleen, and still when I work with her, because uh, we're actually working on, on both original and fan fiction right now, and we still do it the same way, um, we actually take characters. We say, you know, these are your characters, and these are mine, and then I'll write the piece that's my character, and then she'll write the piece that's yours, and then both of us go over it to smooth out things, like if we're writing our character, but we have to interact with the others, we may not get their character quite right, and so we'll have to tweak, you know, the other person will have to tweak it and polish up the, the, the dialogue to make it fit. With Eric, it's quite different. First, we sit down, you know, we sit down either virtually or in real life, and we talk out what we want to have happen, you know, what the concept is first, and then once we've hammered out the concept, then we outline, okay, well, what's the general idea? Um, We made an outline. We did boundary, for example. I think it totaled close to 10,000 words of outline, but that's because we were building the whole universe and we were getting used to, you know, how are we going to do this? But generally, once we've worked out the outline, then I just start writing. After I've gotten, say, 10, 15,000 words of it done, I send it to him and make sure that it looks good. You know, like, oh, so he says, oh, yeah, okay, that's what I wanted to see. And uh, if everything's okay, then I just keep writing. So I usually write the whole first draft and then send it to him. Then he'll do his tweaks, add things, or he'll tell me what's wrong and have me fix it. Um, and then he'll send it back to me, and I'll polish it. And usually after one or two of those uh, iterations, then we're ready to submit it. I am I am a one-shot writer. I don't do editing. I don't do drafts. I don't, you know, I don't, I don't have multiple drafts in general of something. At mm-hmm. most, I will start a second draft if I've written to someone and I say, you know, I'd actually like to do it completely differently from this point. Then I'll just call something draft two and start again. But... I don't, like, go back and then start playing with my wording or re- rewriting this piece or that piece. Um, I can't see it. I can't see any reason to do it. You know, I, don't, I cannot see what's wrong with what I've written until five or six years go by. So that's one reason why I depend on editors like uh, Tony to say, uh, right, well, this is very nice, but this would be even better, and this is why this would be better. 
Mm-hmm. But in general, when I write, it's literally, if, if you send me, see me send you something and you start reading it, that is exactly as it came off my hands the very first time that I typed it, in most cases. It seems like every author is different in that aspect, so... I'm still amazingly gratified by being here, you know, by, by actually being a, a science fiction writer. It's something I've wanted to be since I was six, actually. When I wrote a little story and the people in school liked it so much that they had me read it to like two grades up. And it suddenly dawned on me, that was the point at which I really realized that, wait a minute, books are written by people like me. They're not written by this magical group of authors that aren't like me. I, I want to be one of those. Um, it took me many years, obviously, to achieve that, um, since uh, it wasn't until Digital Night that I was published. And it still feels a bit unreal. Um, you know, I finally got, I got invited as a guest of honor at Lunacon, and it was at that point that I realized, you know, st- I have to stop feeling this this imposter <laughs> feeling of, you know, you're not really a pro. Well, when you get invited as a guest of honor, you've got to accept that you actually have become a pro. And it still feels really weird to even think that for me. I, w- I would like to uh, mention that next year, uh, since we have mentioned Digital Night, the uh, vastly expanded and uh, rewritten version of Digital Night will be released uh, next year, right, Tony? Yes, it's scheduled. Yes, it's scheduled. And I am very much looking forward to that because uh, it brings that book in line with uh, Phoenix Rising, which is set in the same universe, even if on a different planet, and uh, is also expanded enough so that even those who bought the original should uh, find enough in there to make it worth their while. Well, thank you again for being on the Bain Free Radio Hour with us, Reich, and we will be uh, looking forward to reading whatever comes next for Ariane and her companions, and... uh, It's been a great pleasure, and thank you very much. Bye-bye. And now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. This portion of Shadow of Freedom is provided by Audible.com. Get the complete audiobook at Audible.com now. If you're not a subscriber, you can get the entire audiobook free or choose from more than 100,000 other titles when you try Audible for free for 30 days. Okay, here's what has gone before. After a fierce war, Honor Harrington's star kingdom of Manticore has entered into a simmering, low-level conflict with the ancient aristocratic Solarian League. The Solarian League is crumbling, and on the verge, a region on the edge of its empire, rebellion is brewing. The Solarian Office of Frontier Security is in charge of keeping the peace on the verge. Brutal tactics and puppet dictatorships are par for the course for the OFS. Rebels opposed to the oppressive regimes can't hope to match the military might of the OFS without outside aid. Aid they are receiving in the form of weapons drops by agents claiming to represent the Star Kingdom of Manticore. But it's a ruse. These agents actually serve the shadowy Mason alignment, eugenic supremacists who wish to see the Solarian League and the Star Kingdom at war. In the Mobius system, rebels have shown stiff resistance in the face of a reign of terror. Popular opinion has only grown more volatile since a massacre by the presidential guard at a peaceful protest. Now the rebellion has begun in earnest, with an assault on the Capitol. Here is Part 37 of David Weber's Shadow of Freedom. Where the hell are they all coming from? Sven Lombroso demanded. His expression haggard as he stared at the map displays in the command center under Presidential Palace. Leprous scarlet splotches glared across them, marking the death and destruction which had exploded out of the night all across the capital city. My God, there must be thousands of them. I doubt it, Mr. President, Olivia Yardley replied. She wore two separate earbugs, and her own attention was focused on a much larger-scale holographic display of the residential area around Summerhill Tower. Not here in Landon, anyway. Oh, really? Well, just why in hell should I listen to what you doubt? Lombroso snarled. You were the one who thought it was such a wonderful idea to turn the screws on the MLF. Get them to come out in the open, you said. Force their hands. 
Suck them out where we could get at them. He glared at her. Well, that's working out just goddamned fine, isn't it? Yardley swallowed an almost overwhelming impulse to snarl right back at him. He'd seen the same analyses she had, and it was clear she'd been right about the dangerous escalation in the Mobius Liberation Front's organization and equipment. In fact, she'd obviously underestimated both of them, and it was just like him to vent his frustration and his fear by blaming the situation on everyone, anyone other than himself. Yet, tempting though it was to point that out to him, actually yielding to the temptation would all too probably have been a fatal mistake. He was perfectly capable of ordering her shot, and she could think of at least three of her own subordinates who'd pull the trigger themselves if it let them step into her shoes. That would have been uncommonly stupid of them under the current circumstances, but that minor fact wouldn't have prevented any of them from doing it. Mr. President, she said instead, interrupting the reports she should have been listening to and the orders she should have been giving, this is exactly what the analysts and I warned might happen. She met his fiery eyes levelly. It's happening on a lot wider scale than we ever anticipated, and I have to admit the MLF's degree of organization outside landings taken us by surprise, but it was the influx of modern weapons and the MLF's increase in militancy that had all of us concerned in the first place. God only knows what would have happened if we'd sat back and let them choose the moment to kick off their offensive. Well, I don't see how it could be a whole hell of a lot worse. Lombroso shot back. He jabbed an index finger at the maps. Brazelton, Granger, Louisville. How many more towns are we planning to give them? I said their organization and strength outside landing came as a surprise, sir. Yardley replied coldly. Apparently, our intelligence assets let us down pretty badly in that respect. I'm sure General Matyas shared all of his information with the rest of us, but you saw the analyses. She saw the president's eyes flicker at the mention of Matyas's name. I'm not trying to pass the blame, she continued with consummate insincerity, because all of us screwed up in that regard. But the truth is that we can lose all of those towns and half a dozen more if we have to, as long as we hold the capital, we can always take them back again, especially after the gendarme battalions get here. And with all due respect, sir, they have come out into the open. I think it's obvious we're going to get hurt more badly than any of us wanted or expected, but they're going to get hurt even worse because now we know where to find them. Some of the steam seemed to go out of Lombroso's glower. He remained anything but happy, yet Yardley's firm tone and projection of confidence were having their effect. At least until the next time Frolov gets on the comm to rattle his cage, the general thought sourly. She'd heard quite enough from the trifecta manager herself, and she wished to hell that he'd just leave her alone, and that Lombroso would too, for that matter. She had more important things to do than sit around holding frightened Politico's hands, Still, it would have been foolish to expect anything else. The attack on the Summerhill security point had penetrated into one of the trifecta upper crust's more palatial residential districts before guard-quick response teams could reinforce the trifecta security detachments. The security personnel had taken heavy casualties. Worse, over a dozen trifecta bureaucrats had been hurt or killed before the attackers withdrew, and Frolov had made it abundantly clear that lapses like that were unacceptable. And considering how much Trafecta's invested in Lombroso, Frolov obviously thinks he's entitled to a better return. I'll bet he hasn't been shy about making that point either. Funny how much more enthusiastic about taking the fight to the terrorists he was when all it was likely to do was get Guernica killed, isn't it? All we have to do is hold them until the gendarmes get here, she said out loud. I'm going to hit them as hard as I can, anywhere I can, in the meantime, and I think there's a damned good chance we'll be able to handle this on our own, she added with rather less than total truthfulness. But in the final analysis, all we really have to do is hold them. If the first batch of gendarmes doesn't do the trick... Governor Verrocchio and Brigadier Usel will send in however many reinforcements they have to. Do you really think either of them wants Trifecta screaming for their blood to OFS headquarters, Mr. President? 
She smiled unpleasantly. This is going to turn into the best chance we've ever had to burn out the infection once and for all, sir, and all we have to do is hold them. What's the latest from Lewiston? Michael Breitbach looked exhausted, and his shoulders sagged with fatigue. His voice was pretty much gone, too, but his eyes were still focused and intent as he asked the question, and Kaylee Blanchard checked her notepad display. Segovia says his people are making good progress now, she replied. They've got over half the city, and they're moving in on Beaver Run Heights. He says that once they take out the satellite police station there, they should be able to start sending additional manpower to us here in Landon. He... She broke off as her calm beeped at her. She listened intently for several seconds, then nodded with a grunt of satisfaction and looked back at Brightbuck. That was Lemington. She says her people have hacked the guard's satellite feeds. She doesn't know how long she'll be able to stay in the system, but for right now, we've got access to their recon birds right along with them. Good, Kaylee, good. Breitbach managed a weary smile, but there was worry, a lot of worry, in those focused eyes, and Blanchard looked a question at him. All of that sounds good he told her after a moment. But I'm not sure it's good enough. He shook his head, looking down at the map displayed on the terminal in front of him. We needed to get deeper quicker here in Landon. Even with Lemington getting into their recon, we just aren't deep enough, and I'm not sure we're going to get there either. But we're winning in almost all of the outer cities, she pointed out and practically the entire farm belts come in on our side. I know, he nodded. And I know they're going to be a hell of a lot more cautious before they try any more of those air assaults. He showed his teeth in a vicious smile. The Presidential Guard had lost 23 sting ships and 19 countergraph transports trying to reinforce Braselton. Now that they'd discovered that the MLF had modern impeller wedge SAMs, they were unlikely to try that again, not without far better EW capabilities than any of their antiquated equipment boasted anyway. He savored the memory of that moment. But then his smile faded and he shook his head once more. I know, he repeated more softly. But even Lombroso has always recognized that Landon's the real key. There are eight and a half million people in Landon in the suburbs, not to mention the main planetary spaceport the Guard's Central Barracks, Trifecta's entire planetary headquarters complex, and staff, and most of the SUPP's core membership and all of its leadership. If we're going to claim that we control the planet, which makes us the legitimate, or at least the de facto system government, we've got to hold land in. And you can bet your ass that as long as Lombroso and Trifecta hold it, they're going to claim to be the legitimate government. And frankly, we need it for its hostage value. Hostage value? Blanchard looked at him in shock. One thing he'd always insisted upon was that the MLF had to target legitimate objectives and do its level best to hold collateral civilian casualties to an absolute minimum. He'd even successfully opposed the demands of some of his rank and file that the Liberation Front go after anyone who did business with Trifecta. She knew part of that was a cold calculation that the MLF had to avoid providing any grist for SINS's independent newsies efforts to label it a terrorist organization. But she also knew that another part of it, probably the greater part of it, was his personal hatred for the Lombroso regime's policy of ruling by terror and atrocity. I'm not planning on shooting people in the street, Kaylee, he said wearily. But there is a quantitative difference between Landon and any of the other cities, even Laurent. Laurent, Mobius's second largest city, had a population of almost two and a half million. None of the planet's other cities topped 300,000. Lombroso, or the friggin' gendarmes when they get here, could take out 20 or 30 cities the size of Brazelton and Lewiston combined, 
without killing as many people as live in Landon all by itself. And don't think for a moment that Frolov doesn't recognize that, too. I want us holding Landon when the gendarmes get here, because I doubt even OFS is going to be willing to take out eight and a half million revenue-producing trifecta helots with an orbital strike. Not when they know how all the other transstellars are going to react to that kind of threat to their bottom lines. And the longer they hesitate to take us out from orbit, the longer we've got for the manis to come riding over the hyperlimit in the proverbial nick of time. Blanchard looked at him for several more moments, and then she nodded slowly. I guess there's hostage value, and then there's hostage value, she said. Exactly. Breitbach turned his attention back to the map display and squared his sagging shoulders. And maybe I'm wrong. He sounded as if he were willing confidence and fresh determination back into his voice. Maybe we can get deep enough quick enough, especially with Lemington getting us inside their recon. And if Segovia really can free up some additional manpower soon enough? He smiled grimly. And even if we can't take the entire city, I damn well guarantee we'll manage to kill enough more of the bastards to make sure any of them who are still alive remember us for a long, long time. That was David Weber's Shadow of Freedom, Part 37, read by Allison Johnson. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com, thanks to Laura Haywood Corey, Koki Daniel, Layla Menden, and podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a Grand Central Arena species wide round of applause and thanks, and a get out of duels free card for Reich E. Spore, author of Spheres of Influence. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy, and keep reaching for the stars. 